Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the only sports talk show that really matters, the big hit. As always, I'm your host, Tim Quigley. On today's show, we take a look into the NFL, Eagles and Steelers. Both teams have problems to solve, several problems to be exact. Several awards also being handed out in the MLB. We're going to take a look at that for you. Uh, make some predictions on who wins what, on who wins what, if I could say that right. Mike D'Antoni hired as the next Lakers head coach. Will that fix all their problems? And will an IUP beat Ship in a one-sided 41-10 to game to win the PSAC title? But more on that to come. Right now I'm joined by Mike Gosnell and Josh Carney. I'd love to call this segment the first cut. All right, guys, let's dive right on it into it. We've got some NCAA football, and if you missed it this weekend, you missed arguably the best or the second best game of the year as Texas A&M and Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, take down the then number one powerhouse Alabama Ugh. Crimson Tide. It was a great game to watch, guys. I know all of us watched, or at least we saw the highlights. And Josh, I want to start down there with you. Was A&M the better team for this game, or were they just beat up from the LSU game the week prior? Uh, it's, it's tough to tell. I, I really think Bama was really beat up coming off the emotional win in the last second against LSU. They came in dealing with some injuries, and they just didn't look sharp throughout the game. But all the credit goes to Coach Kevin Sumlin and Johnny Manziel and the Texas A&M Aggies. They just outplayed Alabama in every facet of the game. They beat them at their own game of ball control offense with the big splash plays when they needed. And when it came down to it, they were just able to stop Alabama in the running game and put pressure on A.J. McCarron and force him into uncharacteristic mistakes. And that won the game for them. That won the game for them. And also, if you remember correctly, uh, I believe it was a fourth down, a and yeah. on their own two. Yep. Alabama goes off sides, approachment, automatic first down, sealed the game. What would have been 35 seconds left if the penalty had not been committed. Bama would have had the ball 35, probably within their own 50. That's a potential game-winning drive right there, again, for the second week in a row. But, Goose, what did you think of this game? Was, did uh, A&M just outplay Bama? Did they get lucky? Or can you really pin this loss for Bama being beat up last week from LSU? I think it's a combination of both, actually. Um, except for the luck. I mean, A&M's a great team. I think they're the only team out of the Big 12 that went to the SEC, the other team being Missouri, that's actually adjusting well to the SEC play. Uh, Johnny Manziel and the Aggies just, they were the better team, and uh, they won the turnover battle, which is huge in college football, forcing three turnovers from the Crimson Tide. Uh, they held uh, that the Crimson Tide uh, rushing to only 121 yards, which is a season low for Alabama. But uh, overall, I think Alabama just was beat up as well. I mean, that LSU game in Death Valley takes a lot out of you, and I don't, I don't want to say they weren't, weren't prepared, but the Aggies just outplayed them. I really think the biggest play in the game, Goose, was it was fourth and goal for Alabama late in the game, I think just under two minutes, and they ran three straight times, didn't get in with Lacey and Yeldon. Mm -hmm. Their hand was forced. You can't go for it on fourth and, fourth and goal on the ground again at three times after you get stuffed, and A.J. McCarron threw a costly interception. The ball goes right back to Manziel and that A&M offense that just moved the ball at will. That right there, that, that shut the door on uh, Alabama's ba basically season right now. They, they have a lot to go uh, right for them to get back in the title game. We'll talk about that later, Tim. But that, that was the, the changing play in the game. That was a huge interception. McCarron didn't have a pick or didn't have that many picks no. going into that game. And he, he just turned the ball over too many times. And it came down to... I think coaching. I think they didn't let McCarron, who is their best player on offense, win that game for them. They tried relying on the ground game that wasn't working, and when they called on McCarron, he just made mistakes. Well, let's talk about uh, Manziel for just a minute. He's thrown over for 280 yards a game. Yeah. I mean, this is Heisman numbers. His numbers are better than Colin Klein's numbers as of right now, and a and M 6-0 on the road. Yeah. And like I said, I think they're the only team that moved the SEC out of the Big 12 Missouri's, that has, that has yeah. been... Missouri has struggled this year, yeah, but A&M looks has to has adapted just fit well in. to yeah. the SEC type of play. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And talking about Johnny Manziel, I believe he had two touchdowns. I think they were rushing, right? I'm not I believe so. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, he had two touchdowns, about 250, 270 some yards. Uh, again, great game from him. And people have he's really starting to come to fruition now as 
some people have called him the best quarterback to ever come out of the state of Texas. And that is a huge honor when you're in <laughs> he, the state of Texas. He wanted to, he went all his life, I heard, heard, yeah. heard this, he wanted to go to the University of Texas. Texas never offered. And then he went to, I believe, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Then switched to one of the wanted to come one, back home and play. And A and M said, "Yeah, we'll give you yep. a full ride scholarship." He's he's achieving legendary status already, and he's yeah, what it's his it's freshman. A freshman year. Red shirt freshman. Yeah. Red shirt freshman. He, this kid, his... I think, can make it to the next level. He, he's got the arm. He can he can move around. He's mobile. He reminds me, and I know this is gonna be lofty expectations, but just watching him throw and the way he handles himself in the game, he reminds me of Drew Brees. He's got the short stature. He can find the small windows to fit the ball in. He's accurate. This kid has it all, and I think he will win multiple Heisman's by the time he's done here, barring any you know, catastrophic injury. I think he can even be a Heisman finalist this year. He has, as you mentioned, better numbers than Klein. Granted, Klein's team's undefeated, but Manziel is a beast, and he has it all. He deserves every accolade that he will ever get at Texas A&M, and I hope to see this continue for a while. He's definitely an exciting player to watch. And he's going to be for many years to come. Yes, Goose, do you really think Manziel would be a Heisman candidate this year, following years at all? or uh, This year, definitely, but I don't think he will win it. I think it's Colin Klein's basically to lose. I mean, if they don't show yeah. up. If they don't show up against Baylor or Texas, then I think you go to Manti Teo and Johnny Manziel. I think Johnny Manziel is that good of a quarterback. I like your comparison to Drew Brees. He has all the tools that Drew Brees has. I think he's going to be a great quarterback at the next level, and I don't see why. <coughs> Why not that Johnny Manziel will not be a Heisman winner at least two times? He just reminds you, watching him, of the Tim Tebow, Cam Newton, sort of. Obviously, one is more successful in the NFL than the other is, but this kid has it. Kid has it, hey. Josh Carney said it first for anybody <laughs> listening. Uh, guys, I want to take a look now into the top five BCS because that was a major shakeup after the Alabama loss. Uh, if we take a look at it now, number one, K-State, number two, Oregon, number three, Notre Dame, as you can see it right there on your screen, ladies and gentlemen, number four, Alabama, number five, Georgia. I personally thought Bama, after the loss, was going to drop all the way to five, allowing everybody else to move up there. Uh, Josh, you're shaking your head right there. I, I'm going to ask one question right now. I'm going to get into another question later. But what are your thoughts right here on this top five, and would you rearrange it anyhow? Yeah, anyway? and, I, and I switched two teams, and I may catch grief for this after the show. I think Oregon's the best team in the nation at this point. I think they are much better than Kansas State, uh, just in terms of offense. That team is so electrifying. I think they would blow Kansas State out of the water in a game. And the way they are beating teams this year, I don't see how Oregon doesn't get the number one spot after Alabama falls. I, I don't see how Kansas State is a better team than them. And other than that, the rest of the top five is fine. I, I like Alabama and Georgia rounding it out. I think those two will meet in the SEC championship game. Uh, but... The top three that are undefeated, I just would have Oregon 1, K-State 2, Notre Dame 3. I actually do agree with that. I know we don't agree on much, but we'll agree on this one. Uh, they put, Oregon put up 59 points on Cal, and granted it's Cal. They but, also put up 62 against USC. Yes, and uh, there's no better offense in the nation right now than Oregon. And I would, I, you know, the AP poll put Oregon 1. I would agree with that. I think it should be Oregon 1, K-State 2, yeah. and the rest I would agree with. Yeah. I, at the end of the day, I really think K-State's going to drop a game here. They have two games left, Baylor and Texas. I don't Who think out they of can, those two could beat them, though? Baylor. Baylor. Baylor can put up points just as well as K-State can. And I, I just think they're going to fall with the pressure of being the number one team in the nation. I think they're going to crumble underneath that because Klein has never experienced that. Bill Snyder hasn't really experienced that as a head coach. And I think they're going to fall apart here in the last two weeks. Uh, they'll still play in a major bowl, but I don't see them making a national title game. Yeah, and you can say this about Oregon, too. Their schedule, <coughs> excuse me, is backloaded. They've mm -hmm. got, I believe, Oregon State coming up. They've got Stanford this weekend. they still got to beat SC to win the Pac-12 title. Yeah. So. And, and they're going to Oregon State in Corvallis, which is a notoriously tough place to play. Ask yeah, Wisconsin so, this year. Yeah. So if they, if they can sure. win out, I think they jump to number one right there. They have there. to. They, they would have to. But the argument can be made for K-State, too. So, again, it's well, going gonna, gonna to be a few good weeks to watch. I what know a, we really can't preview ahead. What about Notre Dame, game. though? What do you think Notre Dame does? I think they lose to USC. You do? I think there's one undefeated team at the end of the year, and that's going to be Oregon. I, I don't see them putting up points with USC like any other team. I'm the host. I'm not going to put my opinion in on here. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to stay neutral, stay natural ground, but you know what? Go Notre Dame. That's, just all, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. All right, guys, and the last question I want to ask here before we got to – Unfortunately, cut this segment off, go to our first commercial break. 
Will there be an SEC team in the title game this year? Alabama and Georgia, I think. Yeah, I think Georgia. Yeah. 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 Well, duh. Uh, nope, those, nope. those guys sitting four and five. Do they think or can something happen that those guys make a BCS title game this year? Yeah. I, as I mentioned, I think K-State is going to fall. I think Notre Dame is going to fall. So that bumps Oregon to one. Alabama and Georgia will square off for the SEC title here late in November. One of those two, whoever wins, if K-State Notre Dame fall, will move up ahead of them and be the number two team, and they're going to face, a, face off against Oregon. Personally, I think it's going to be Alabama. I think Alabama is still a very good team. I just think last week was kind of a letdown emotionally. They weren't ready, but I think they're a very good team. They're one of the best teams I've ever seen in college football on both sides of the ball, and I think it's going to be one electrifying BCS title game between Oregon and Alabama. See, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I think K-State will run the table. I think uh, they, their only shot of getting upset is against actually Texas. I think Texas had a lot to prove, and they, okay. they, they put up big numbers against Iowa State. And uh, – I, I could see Notre Dame losing the USC. I definitely could, but yeah, I point, think I, I think at this point you're you're looking at Oregon and Kansas State in your national title game. I think the run, what is it, six straight years of the straight, of an yeah. SEC team involved in the BCS title game. I think that comes to an end. You're going to have a Big Twelve, Pac ten, Pac twelve, BCS title game. Wow, well, we'll That's, it's, it's weird to see not seeing an SEC team in the title game. Yeah, the first time in six years. As we kind of mentioned up here, I, uh, I'm going to give my opinion real quick. I think Oregon, Oregon is going to have a hard time. They could drop one, and I think it might be against Oregon State in that Civil War game. Okay. If they drop, Notre Dame will move up. So I'm maybe looking at I know Anthony Shear is probably going to be jumping for joy when I say this. It's a K-State Notre Dame game. And he's probably we can't gonna, let him have one prediction, right? It's not going to happen. Hey, everybody's Sorry, allowed versus one. bubble. It's not going to happen. Hey, hey, right now I'm going to say it's <laughs> happening if that means anything at all. But you know what, guys? Time to go to our first commercial break. We can definitely talk about this for a lot longer. But Mike Gosnell, Josh Carney joining me right here. Up next, though, it's going to be some NFL talk. So you don't want to miss that one. So stay tuned. Our analysts are really dedicated. They're constantly researching before the show, making sure they know all their information, their stats, their players, the team names. They're just, they're really good. Saints, dude. Saints, like Saints, Saints. Right there. Red Sox. Uh, Red Wings, Tigers. Is that Saints. Columbus Tigers, over there, Tigers, Tigers, Arsenal, Atlanta Falcons, right Arsenal, Detroit. Chelsea, Sun, Flyers, guys, Sun. guys, one at a time. Sorry, Mike. You got Boston down there. And welcome back into the big hit. As promised before the break, it's our NFL segment. Right now I'm joined in the middle by Josh Jones. On the end, Dimitri George. And guys, let's get right on into it here. I'm going to start out in Philadelphia. Unfortunately for me and Josh, anyway, Dimitri, yeah. I mean, we're going to get to Big Ben and his injury a little later. But Michael Vick goes down this game with a concussion. Eagles fans see the emergence of Nick Foles. But as you can see there, Cowboys win the game 38 the 23. Dimitri, I'll start down there with you. Uh, Andy Reid's quoted after the game saying, Vic has a pretty serious concussion. It's not good news down in Philadelphia. Uh, I want to ask you, Nick, or Nick, geez, Dimitri, man, I'm screwed. I'm, I'm getting to Nick. <laughs> Nick Foles. Nick Foles coming. How do you think he does, and is the season all but over? Well, I think uh, Nick, Flo Nick Foles um, last week was thrown into the fire. Um, he didn't have any reps during practice that week, as most backup quarterbacks don't. Um, however, I thought uh, in the third quarter when they were able to get, get the lead, I thought he in the, came out of the second half um, and actually played pretty well. Uh, fourth quarter was a different story, but uh, I, just, I just think that Nick Foles, you know, I think that Andy Reid's going to condense the playbook a little bit, you know, help him out, you know, get the ball, run the game, run the ball a little bit. Um, I think they have uh, Washington this week who's coming off a bye, so it'll be, it's a divisional game, it'll always be tough. Um, but, you know, they got to protect him. If they weren't, Michael Vick's a mobile quarterback, you know, Nick Foles is kind of the more of the pocket passer, so they, he needs, they need to run the ball, so I help the line, you know, be able, be able to protect him. Um, but, uh, you know, typical rookie quarterback, he'll have his ups and downs, but, uh, you know, he has a chance to do some pretty good things. Yeah, definitely. And like you said, Andy Reid, condense the playbook. If Sean McCoy doesn't get more than 30 uh, carries a game now, Quite honestly, I don't know when he will. Oh, but yeah. Josh, uh, what do you think about this? How do you think Foles comes in, uh, and how does the season outlook from here look? Well, Foles, I think he comes in. He can he coming strong because I know 
he set a school record with 10,000 yards at his college, so he has a lot of potential. But I think a lot of more time is going to be seen on McCoy. He, he's been the horse. They're going to ride him at least twice as hard now. But they're probably going to start foes off with a lot of short throws, three, five-yard screen passes, because I don't think they're really trusting him to throw downfield, which is understandable because he's a rookie and hasn't gotten that much time with the number one, the number one strength. But um, the season outlook, I don't see it going too well. We're three and six right now. But there is a little bit of hope because last year two teams made with an eight and eight record into the playoffs. So there's possible, but the window is closing very fast. Yeah, and I'm with you guys there. I did like what I saw from Nick Foles in the third quarter. First pass, a little swing pass to McCoy. Good little four-yard pickup. His next pass, stood in the pocket, stepped up, delivered a great strike to Jason Avant, but that's when Avant tweaked his hamstring and it bounced right off his helmet. So yeah, say, from that point on, it's, oh, geez, come okay. on, really, <laughs> more injuries. But injury is part of the game. you got to deal with them next week. we have to see how he does. we have to yeah. see how Foles does, thrown into the fire yet again. Yeah. McCoy's the key. they got to get the ball in his hands. Get the ball to McCoy, please, Andy Reid, if you're listening exactly. to the big hit on IPTV. <laughs> McCoy, please, please, please give the ball to McCoy. Of course he's listening. Of course he's, of course he's listening. <laughs> Only right, let's, that let's take a look. Uh, also this weekend, we had a matchup of two 7-1 and one teams. Only one team can win the game. That uh, team was the Texans, moving to 8-1 and one on the season. Jay Cutler getting a concussion in this game. Concussion's pretty heavy theme yeah. over last weekend. But, guys, I want to ask you, are the Texans now – your Super Bowl favorite teams out of the AFC? I would have to say so. Um, I, I feel like they've been a, a, a legit contender um, the entire season. Uh, you know, they have a great defense. And you know what? It was, it was great to see them beat Chicago in Chicago's backyard and in their own, you know, playing their own game. You know, they were forcing right. turnovers. I think they had four um, as opposed to the Bears, too. Uh, they were able to run the ball. I think Arian Foss had uh, over, I think a little bit over 100 yards. Um, it, was, it was wet, it was cold, it was rainy, and they were able to just pound the ball, play great defense. Um, and they, they're going to be a tough, a tough uh, team to beat in the playoffs. You know? I think they're going to have home field advantage. And you know, that last year, was, they got their playoff experience. They, had to be, they were able to beat the Bengals. Um, they played close, close with Baltimore with a rookie quarterback, fifth-round pick, T.J. Yates. Um, now they got Matt Shaw back healthy. So they're definitely uh, the class of the AFC as we speak right now. I can agree 100% out of the AFC. They are the favorites, like you said, one of the top defenses. Their offense is, is pretty good as well. The, now, they're the favorites out of the AFC, but I won't say overall to me. I'm, I still have to go with the Green Bay Packers just because of what they did to them. Maybe it was an aberration, maybe not, but that remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. And also, like I said during this game, Bears quarterback Jay Cutler out with a concussion. Guys, best team in the NFC up to that point, I believe, still – uh, they still are the best team in the NFC, but how does the Cutler injury affect them for the rest of their season? Well, we saw what happened last year uh, when they lost Cutler. Uh, they just their season turned out horrible. I mean, they were on a roll last year. Cutler went down, Forte went down, and their season just basically ended right there. Um, you know, hopefully it's not a severe concussion. I mean, it was a pretty big hit, but you got it. Got, it got a flag. Well, yeah, it definitely well, got a flag. Um, the helmet, the helmet. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, they're trying big to protect, hit. They're trying to protect the quarterbacks. So, uh, they, you know, it's a concussion. He may play this week, he may not. Um, but that defense has been carrying him all year, and I, I don't expect anything to change. Um, they're getting a lot of points. They're, they're scoring points on defense. They're getting turnovers. Um, as, long, as long as Jason Campbell, the backup, doesn't screw it up, I think they'll be fine. And, as I said, defense has been carrying them. That's where all their points really has been come from. Their offense really isn't that good anyway. But their defense, most turnovers, mm -hmm. force in the league. Just a lot of pick sixes, fumble returns, and if they keep that up, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Well, <laughs> hey, words out of Josh Jones. You got to believe him all the time, anyway. <laughs> this is true. It's, this is true. Coming this from true. it, this is true. Hey guys, let's let's uh, turn it back to Pennsylvania. Bring it local. Pittsburgh Steelers, and quite honestly, caught everybody by surprise, including myself. I'll say this right now. I sent out in the content, quote, talk about the Steelers game. Let's be honest, it's the Chiefs. They should win, right? <laughs> Well, I was almost wrong there, as you can see right there. The Steelers beat the Chiefs in OT 16-3. to Big Ben suffers, I believe, an AC sprain in his shoulder, or SC, SC. an SC. SC. Okay, wrong letter. But, again, pretty not a severe shoulder injury. It'll keep him out a week. Mm -hmm. Loosen it up a little bit. He'll be fine to go in the following week. But 
Talk about that game. Uh, how much will the injury hurt them this coming week? And just kind of talk about next week's game a little bit. This injury for the Pittsburgh Steelers couldn't have come at a worse time um, as they are getting prepared to play the Baltimore not only this week, but two, out of the two times out of the next three weeks. Um, last night, um, even with Ben, the offense looked a little sluggish. Um, the Steelers tend to do this, as we've seen in the, pre in the previous, uh, early in the season with uh, Tennessee and Oakland. They tend to play down in the competition. Uh, but like I said, you know, this, time, this injury is very uh, untimely, um, as you could say. Uh, Baltimore's coming in. They just put a beating on the Oakland Raiders. Um, and, you know, it's a divisional game. Um, I expect it to still be close, even if Ben doesn't play. Um, because, you know, it, it's Steelers-Ravens. It's in, it's in Pittsburgh, so that's always going to give them a, a little bit of a help. Um, but, you know, Pittsburgh's got their work cut out for them if they want to win this game. I have to say I was pretty disappointed in Pittsburgh. I'm not the biggest fan of them, but it's, KFC. it's, it's Kansas City. Everybody should blow them out. Even the Raiders should beat them. But the only thing I can say is this is a horrible time for the injury. And even when he comes back at it, come back out of it, it'll probably still be sore. Mm -hmm. So they have to ride their defense, which is, well, they've been called the steel curtain. So it's time for them to truly prove it or they're going to be a rough couple games. Now, I want to ask you another thing about the Steelers here. As we saw last game, Brian Leftwich comes in back up for the remainder of the game. Does, how do you think he fares this week if he starts? Or could Charlie Batts possibly be activated to start? Well, uh Mike Tomlin said in his press conference today that in the event that Ben does not go, Byron Leftwich will be the starter. Um, and I think, you know, as with Foles, I think I don't think they're condensed the playbook, but I feel like they're going to play to his strengths. You know, ben, Byron Leftwich is not a mobile quarterback like Ben is. He's going to sit in the pocket and he's going to read defenses. He's, gonna, he's got that elongated motion that's going to take a while, so his quick passes are going to be a bit troubling. Um, you might see some more shots down the field as he's got a big arm to, to Wallace. You know, maybe Brown comes back this week. You know, you, uh, you don't know that, but um, you know, with a full week of practice, um, you know, I think that you know Byron's more than capable of uh, you know helping them get a W this weekend. I have to say, with Left Leftwich and Batch, it's time to get your running game up because I personally I don't really have faith in either of these quarterbacks. Recently, they get very little little time, little in with the reps. And we know we, they're not wild cards, not rookies, so we know what they can do and what they can't do. And they're both kind of past their years, so I would say get your running game up or, once again, it's going to be a long few games. Yeah, yeah definitely get the run game up. A little uh, slacked off from it last game against Kansas City of all teams, but, hey, <laughs> wins the win even in overtime with the field goal. Scary True. overtime win, but mm -hmm. wins the win. All right, guys, one more thing I want to ask you. Give me your player of the week so for, for uh, this last week. Who do you think it is and why? I've got to go with uh, Adrian Peterson, um, who had 27 carries for over 170 yards and I think a touchdown. What he's been able to do coming back from the ACL injury no more than uh, about 10 months ago. Um, he had this uh, uh, major knee surgery, uh, and he's just been on a tear. You know, I think he's leading the league in rushing. Um, so you know, he's, he's definitely uh, been... The reason why Minnesota is uh, six and four. My player is also coming off of injury. I have to go with Payne Manning, simply for the fact that he just threw his 420th touchdown pass, going for second all time, right next to Brett Favre, who is my favorite quarterback. So I mean, I hope he doesn't catch him, but still got to give props where props is due, and Payne Manning gets those props. All right, good choices for player of the week. These guys are always. My analyst of the week, if I'm going to make up that award, I don't know. I'm going to have to start making it up after Thanksgiving break. For Josh Jones, Demetri George, that's it for this segment. Up next, it's the MLB Awards segment. See who our analysts have picked to win certain awards. Always a fun time. Make sure you stay tuned. I've called this press conference today to announce a very special signing into the Big Hit family. Once again, we're here to announce... Mike Nicastro, as member of the Big Hit. You gotta be for, kidding me. I know, man. This, this keeps getting old. But again, Mike Nicastro. Woo hey, damn is that? Stage is yours, buddy. Make your speech for the millionth time. <laughs> Let's take some questions. You with the brain, Dorothy. So, how many returns does this make it for you to the Big Hit? Dumb question. Next. Yeah, green. Go ahead. Why do you keep coming back? It makes no sense at all. It makes perfect sense. 
to everybody here. Everybody misses me. They want to see me on a daily basis. They want to see what my beard will look like next. The next time that I'll hit Quigley. I have nothing to say for this question, to be honest. Um, it's not Wednesday. Why are you wearing pink? You're right. It's Tuesday. But God, do I love pink. And welcome back into the only sports talk show that really matters, the big hit here on IUP TV. And joining me now in the middle, Bree Spitzer on the end, Kyle Pillar. And as I said before the break, it's MLB Awards time. We're going to start out with Manager of the Year, which, to our, well, not to our surprise, but it's already been announced. In the AL, you've got Bob Melvin as your Manager of the Year. And in the NL, one Davey Johnson of the League Best Washington Nationals. Kyle, I'll start it off down there with you. Uh, would you have picked anybody else for manager of the year? And do you agree with these uh, awards given out to Bob Melvin and Davey Johnson? Do you agree with that? Uh, Bob Melvin, I, I didn't even think was really on the radar, uh, to be honest. Uh, I had Buck Showalter for the American League. Uh, but Davey Johnson, I think, is a great pick. I, I think they're both great picks. Uh, but Davey Johnson, really, he brought this Nationals team back from – uh, the, over the last few years, he's really developed a very young team. Uh, they've had a lot of phenomenal players, uh, Steven Strasburg. And I, I think uh, the, the award is, is, is uh, even more worthy to go to David Johnson because of the way he handled the situation with Steven Strasburg and shutting him down this year. But as you look at this team, they were 98-64, and 64, somewhere in that ballpark this year. That they were in the playoffs for the first time. Uh, they hosted a playoff uh, in Washington for the first time since 1933. David Johnson uh, was my guy uh, from from the start, really, when I was looking at it. But Bob Melvin, also a good pick, did a lot of great things this season. So I, I wouldn't take away uh, either of these awards. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of us, I know Kyle, you and I have always said Buck Show Water in the AL with the uh, Buck Truck. The Buck Truck, The Buck yeah. Truck, the classic yeah. saying. Fortunately, kind of ran out of gas there at, there at the end, but... <laughs> Had a good year for Baltimore. A lot of things to look forward to next year. But, Bree, uh, do you agree with these two awards, or would you have changed it up a little bit? I had Davey Johnson from the start for the National League. I thought he guided the Nationals to the playoffs when nobody thought it was going to happen. He really knew how to bring the team together and do what nobody expected, and that's what makes a really good manager. But I have to disagree with Bob, uh, Bob Melvin. I had Buck Showalter. I just felt like he wasn't afraid to mix around the lineup or anything, and he really led the Orioles to a great season, which no one saw coming. And um, they had a 24-win improvement under his uh, reign, so I yeah. think he would have been a good choice. But definitely. I mean, both of them, it was good competition. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. Orioles had a year better year than they've had probably in the last 10 Four, years. 14 years. Yeah, 1997. Yeah, 1997. Look at mm -hmm. Bree pulling out yeah. the years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did her homework. Um, again, I, I, I liked... I wish Buck would have won it, but in the end, Bob Melvin, the mm -hmm. A's, nobody really expected anything from the it's A's. It's a tough choice, honestly. Especially in the division look, they were in. Yeah, you look at two small, smaller market teams in Baltimore and Oakland, and, and it's kind of a toss-up where it's, okay, I mean, they're not small markets, but when you consider baseball, it's just uh, every year you're going to see a Joe Girardi do something big with the Yankees or a, a former Terry Francona with the Red Sox or something like that. But So I think it's good for baseball to see two managers with two, uh, of two very young teams really uh, become a, a prominent figure, Bree, in, you know, in the coaching world of baseball. So Davey Johnson and Bob Melvin are great, but Buck mm -hmm. Showalter, he'll be certainly in the midst of, uh, of another good season next year for the Orioles. Exactly, and they worked with the lineup that they had. I mean, mm -hmm. those great teams that we hear about all the time, they have, like, the grade-A starters everyone expects to do really well. So they just took everyone for a surprise. Took everyone for a surprise mm -hmm. and expect more of them next year. More surprises coming out of Oriole Town and whatever the Oakland A's A call A-Town, A -Town, A -Town. I guess. Oh, <laughs> and anyway, I'm going to stop trying to make up that kind of stuff. All right, let's move on to the Cy Young <laughs> Award. Let's start in the AL. Kyle, who do you have in the AL Cy Young Award race? I have David Price uh, of the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, he was 20-6 and six this year. Uh, you see, see the numbers there. Uh, had 31 games pitched. He had 256 uh, ERA, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, he's kind of been a, a dominant figure the last couple of years. I mean, Justin Verlander is always a, a big pick 
You know, I mean, there's so many good pitchers in the uh, in the in the AL, but I think David Price really, uh, even though the Rays uh, didn't do very well this season, I think he kept that ball club together. Uh, he only he only gave up uh, 16 home runs this season, as you can see uh, by by the graphic, and and I think too the 226 batting average. It's not the lowest it could be, but I really like David Price and what he did this year. Uh, he just uh, really uh, put on a, a good performance in Tampa. Hey, he's always been. Good performer down in Tampa. Great left-handed pitcher. Nasty stuff and a great, what well, was about a 93, 95 heater, would you say? Yeah. The great stuff always out of the lefty David Price. Bree, who do you have in the AL? I am actually going for Justin Verlander. I think uh, David Price is a very good option. Everyone, they're all good candidates, but uh, I feel like he definitely deserves to get this award for another year. And this will be the first time since Pedro Martinez won it in 1999 and 2000 back-to-back. All in all, he is the best pitcher in the American League, and he leads the league with strikeouts, with a total of 239. However, his winning record is a little smaller, 17 wins and 8 losses, where Price and Weaver both have uh, 20 wins and 5 losses. But I feel like Justin Verlander, he is the best pitcher we have, and um, he knows how to carry his team, and he's consistent. Consistent. That's all mm -hmm. you can ask for when you're going out of a guy. Exactly. You need someone you could rely on. You need someone you could rely on. Justin mm -hmm. Verlander, definitely that guy. Uh, Kyle, back to you. Who do you got in the NL? I have R.A. Dickey uh, from the, the New York Mets, and a nasty curveball pitcher, or excuse me, a knuckleball pitcher. Uh, you see his numbers there. He did 273 ERA. Again, not the lowest uh, in, in the major leagues, but this guy has one of the biggest hearts. And, uh, I mean, there, there was a story that came out uh, of, uh, this year, Bree, of what he overcame as a child and, and how he got to stardom. And uh, so I, I really think that R.A. Dickey really – Put together a good year. He, I believe, had 20 win, 21 wins and six losses, some, yep. somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but he had a great first half of baseball. Uh, he was a starter, or was I can't remember if he was a starter in, in the All Star game or not, but certainly worthy of it. He was there. Uh, but put together a good year. Kind of fell off a little bit in the second half of the season, as did the Mets. But nonetheless, Ari Dickey gets uh, my NL Cy Young award. Break. I agree with um, everything you said. You basically <laughs> said it all. He. Uh, He's leading the National League with 230 strikeouts. And during the times when the Mets were struggling to hit, he still managed to come out with wins for the team. He's a great leader, and I feel like the Mets really, really uh, could like really rely on him. So, Yeah, it's a great story, too. The 38, I believe he's 38, 37. Yeah. Your old guy, former high draft pick out of Texas, has massive arm problems, goes back to the minors and learns mm -hmm. the knuckleball and basically revives his career as a 39-year-old. Great Great uh, pitcher. My pick, though, Gio Gonzalez, Washington Nationals, 21 wins. Great record first year in the NL. And, guys, uh, let's take a look at the MVP, starting with the AL. Probably the tougher pick. Kyle, who do you have? Uh, for the AL MVP, uh, I actually forget who I sent uh, Jess my, uh, my pick. Uh, but uh, there Mike Trout, Mike, Mike Trout. Mike Trout. <laughs> Mike I just Trout. totally blanked. I apologize for that. Uh, there was, I was thinking of my, my NL MVP. Uh, but there you see Mike Trout. I really think he changed the game of baseball. He's only 21 years old. Uh, he had 30 home runs. He had 46 uh, stolen bases and 83 RBIs. Uh, really just a, a very electric guy in an in a, in a older team, I guess, with the Angels. He really came out and, like I said, he changed baseball, and he really made it so that, you know, it, it was exciting for fans to watch, especially in a, in a town that, that baseball – you know, coming over with Albert Pujols, he kind of electrified it, Bree, a little bit. And I, I really think that, I mean, his, his antics in the outfield, too, su superb defense. And uh, I think Mike Trout uh, deserves the, the MVP. Bree, who do you have? I, I disagree with you. I mean, Mike Trout is definitely, he has a lot of potential. He's such a younger guy. But uh, I have Miguel Cabrera from the Tigers. He is a triple crown winner, the third baseman. He's such a powerful hitter. And... <laughs> And uh, he has 44 total home runs and 139 RBIs. I mean, he has, like, the rap sheet. He just is a wonderful, wonderful hitter. And he led uh, the American League with a .330 batting average. I feel he is definitely the better choice. <laughs> it's, it's a hard choice, too, in the AL. It's, you got you to go with the first Triple Crown winner since 67 yeah. or with the guy who's yeah. done something nobody's ever done before. Exactly. Yeah. It's a hard choice. Yeah. Choice, that's that's going to be well, the who one. Who do you have? Who do you have, Tim? Oh, geez, i got to break the tie. I know. I gotta go Let's with Cabrera. See. I gotta go with Cabrera yeah. with the triple crown yeah. as a 330 <laughs> average, 40 some homers, almost 140 RBI. 
Mm -hmm. I, I'll take that every day of the week. Last one, guys, and I'm getting told to move it along. Who do you got really quickly and why? Uh, just Buster Posey, New York, uh, for the excuse me, San Francisco Giants. You see it there. 336 average, comeback player of the year. That uh, average led the uh, National League this year. Uh, also, just uh, over, 100, over 100 RBIs, 24 home runs. Great player, uh, great locker room presence. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you on uh, Buster Posey. I just thought it was really admirable how he was out for most of the 2011 season with a leg injury, but then he came back and did not skip a beat. And starting off with a rookie, winning the Rookie Award of the Year in 2010, that's got to be saying something. Plus his leading batting average. Yeah, I know. Uh, you could have Braun in there. You could have a couple other guys, but... Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a pick. If I'm right, if I got a vote, it's going to be Andrew McCutcheon of the hometown Pirates. If they don't have that collapse this year, I think he's good. He's right up there at the top of the race because mm -hmm. he was leading batting average race there for a little while. He was. He was up there. Yeah, he, had, he, had, he had a career year. Yeah, he was above Melky Cabrera uh, for a majority of the season. This kind of slump going into late August, uh, September. So. Yeah. So if, if we if I get a vote, if I get a vote, I guess if I can talk. It's McCutcheon. But, guys, that's going to be it for this segment. When we get back from break, more of the awards are going to be announced. I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking about that. But up next, it's time to jump onto the hardwood floors of the NBA. So stay tuned. You know, since this whole NHL lockout thing, the analyst thinks they can just demand stuff. I, I don't understand it. We've been in intense talks for the last few weeks. I think, I think this is fair. I don't know. I mean, change, make a change here, make it like that. They want, they, 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 they want a dressing room. Like, we, no, we don't okay. have room for dressing room. We don't have room for dressing room. But what if we compensate okay. with the soda machine? Okay, we'll, so add, in, we'll add in that. Okay. okay. You, think, you think this is good? I don't, even, I don't even know why these guys are complaining. I don't know. Me neither, but you know, you know what? You know what? Sometimes you gotta make sacrifices, dude. You gotta okay. make sacrifices. As the analyst representatives, do you think this is fair? Yeah, for you, I think it's pretty fair. I think this is a good deal. Send them in. They better give us what we want. We worked too hard for too long. If everything's not what I want on that paper, I'm walking right out of there. I'm with you. Okay, gentlemen, let's go. Let's do this, boys. Go. Gentlemen, please sit down. We believe that this is the best deal to represent both sides equally. We hope you agree. I think it's the best deal. I mean, you see here, all the X's and O's are, are right here. I don't see what I wrote down. And I don't see what I wrote down either. Don't so, but don't you guys want to be on TV? Uh, they don't accept the deal. Are you serious? We're never going to get anything done. And welcome back into the big hit on the only TV station that really matters, IUP TV. Oh, man. I know I know, screwed that, but we're going to keep going with it. I'm, we're going to keep the train rolling. Brent Warfel, Marquita Holmes. We're here to talk NBA. Guys, let's get right, right on into it here. Lakers hire Mike D'Antoni as their next head coach. Marquita, we'll start it down there with you. Agree or disagree, will the team ever get back together? I wholeheartedly, completely disagree with this decision. I more so disagree with the fact that you would fire a coach five games into the season. They had a lockout season last year, so it was only 66 games. You don't have a training camp. You go right into the playoffs. This season, he's trying to implement a new offense and a Princeton offense, something that these players are not accustomed to. You have Dwight Howard, who's coming off of a back injury. You have uh, Kobe, who has had nagging injuries throughout his career, but he has never let that bother him. He always, Kobe is going to play. Steve Nash goes out with an injury. So these guys haven't really had the chance to gel, learn this offense, get each other's uh, game together, find that chemistry that they need to be productive. So I think he was fired, he as in Mike, 
Brown was fired too early and getting Dan Tony, I don't think that was the right guy, especially when you had Phil Jackson in your in your back pocket who was willing to come back for two years, just $10 million. He was willing to come back and you choose to go with Dan Tony, who's never been to a finals. He so he's never won. Yeah, he's coached Steve Nash to two MVPs. He's helped coach Kobe and Dwight with the Olympic teams, but he doesn't have that chemistry with this. He won't have that chemistry with this team, and I don't think he's the right guy for this roster. Right. I agree. I think Mike Mike Brown should have had a, a lot more time to work with this team. Anyone can win with this team. It's it's Dwight Howard, it's Kobe Bryant, it's Paul Gasol. If you give them enough time on the court to play together and to mesh, I th I know that they can win. They can win right. pl 50 plus games. It doesn't matter who's on the sidelines. So I, Mike Brown was fired entirely too early. At least give him to the All Star break. But if you have a chance to pick up Phil Jackson after you fire a coach, why not? Why if this guy is the Zen master? He's he's re he reinvented basketball in so many ways. He's got so many rings. It's it's unbelievable that they didn't take him and they went with D'Antoni. I think one of the main reasons why Phil was an Irish is I think he wanted a lighter travel schedule. He didn't want to travel to the faraway games. I think that's what made the Lakers a little hesitant of rehiring it's him. It's Phil Jackson. I, I know it's Phil Jackson, but it, if he doesn't want to travel, then, hey. Then you don't want to win as yeah, a Laker. You could have that argument there. But Mike D'Antoni got the job. He might have been. I think he was even a little surprised, too, that they yeah. kind of passed on Phil. But, again, I, I agree. you got to give the guy more than five games to make a decision. Maybe not the all-star break, like you said, but at least 20, 25, maybe 30 games in. At least a quarter of the season at, to, yeah, at least. to get something done. Just just my opinion. And uh, right now, I want to go into a surprising team that, well, that's quite, quite honest, I just said it surprised you this year. Marquita, who's that team for you? Well, so far, I would have to go with the New York Knicks. Carmelo Anthony is leading the league in scoring with over 27 points per game. They're 4-0, the only undefeated team. <laughs> Uh, their second in point score with over 104. Their first in points allowed with only 87. So they're coming out and they're they're running you up and down the court on offense, and then they're stopping you on defense. So I think they had the right right pieces in place. With that being said, Amari Stoudemire, superstar caliber uh, forward, he's been injured. As always, I think this team is better without him. Nobody's going to want to get that contract, so you won't be able to trade him. But right now, this team is better without him. And I, I hope that when he comes back, they can keep the chemistry going because Carmelo is on fire. And you don't want to disrupt that. He has this magic going. The Knicks are hot. This may be the year they win a playoff series. New York Knicks are definitely surprising. Carmelo is doing some amazing stuff this year. And he is one of those players that can take your team all the way to the championship. But if I had to go with a surprising team, I would go with the Memphis, Memphis Grizzlies. Right. They're on a five-game win streak. They're doing some great things. They, they play some great defense. They're very physical and tough. If you look at them, they, they've gone deep for the last – deep in the, into the season the last couple of years. I think yeah. they can get a run together this season. Definitely. Uh, definitely New York Knicks. I think they're still sitting on top of the Eastern Division if I'm – Right. Yeah, they're still sitting on top there. Uh, who's your most disappointing team so far? And this could be – Several teams. It could be Detroit. It could be Indiana. Uh, Washington has had a bad few years, but out of <laughs> bad couple of years. <laughs> but who's your most disappointing team so far this season? Uh, right now, I would have to go with um, the Indiana Pacers. I know Danny Granger is hurt, but you have George Hill, you have David West, and you have Roy Hilbert. You have three key pieces in place to win some games. They're three and four. It is an early season, but three of those, of those first four losses were by a combined six points. You have to close out games. As simple as that. If you can't close out a game, you don't deserve to win. And right now, they're showing us that they don't deserve to win without their superstars. So this team just needs to come together. It's only seven games into the season. So right now, I'm disappointed because of how they won in the playoffs last year, how they pushed the heat last year. But I think in due time, they'll come together and, and they won't be as disappointing once Danny Granger gets back. Well, the easiest disappointing team for me to pick is the Los Angeles Lakers because in the summer, you've, you've heard so much about the, this team and how, how awesome it's pretty much going to be on TV. But we haven't seen any of it. We haven't seen the flair that we thought we'd see with the White Howard and Kobe Bryant. It's, it's nothing what anyone appeared it to be. I mean, maybe some people did call this, but I... I don't know. I just, the Lakers, I expected a lot more from them. I agree. One thing you can, though, expect out of the Lakers is that they will get better. <clears throat> they've got four guys that they've got to mesh together. Steve Nash, when he's healthy, Pal Gasol, Kobe Bryant, and Dwight Howard. 
You can kind of compare this to what happened in Miami last year with the big three, but again, three to four. Four is going to take a little more time to gel together than three. That's the only math I'm ever going to do <laughs> on this show. Uh, uh, and one more thing before we cut into break, guys. Uh, who is your most underrated player so far? Not overrated. I'm talking underrated. Who has not performed to their standards that they should this year? Marquita, if you want to take it away, go for it. Well, underrated, I would have to go with uh, a superstar. So I would have to go with maybe, you know, a guy like Kevin Durant. I Kevin say Durant. underrated uh, underrated because we're used to Kevin Durant just being this monster, this Durantular. Without James Harden, his game has to change. He has to evolve his game. I know they have Kevin Martin, but Kevin Martin isn't a great defensive player like James Harden was. So now you have to you have to play harder on defense, which takes away from your ability on offense. So I, I'm not doubting him by any means. He's probably going to win the scoring title again. He's going to have a chance to to win MVP. He's probably going to be back in the finals this year, leading that Thunder team. But right now, early in the season, I think he just has to get reacquainted with his team, with these new pieces in place, and without James Harden. But I, I'm not worried by any means. Kevin Durant. It's going to produce. I'm glad you, you went with the superstar because I'm going to go with the superstar. I'm going to go with Kobe Bryant. Everyone <laughs> is judging the Lakers. Yeah, you're really right. bashing the Lakers now. The, well, this is a good thing. I mean, he's under, <laughs> underrated in his, in his terms is that people don't think that the Lakers are going to get it done. Remember, they have Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant can possibly win them 40 games by himself taking it over. So if I had to pick anything, I would go. Kobe Bryant. And I would go also, I would take it to an ex-Laker and Andrew Bynum. He was supposed to be back during training camp. He was supposed to already be back. Now he might not come back until January. He hasn't played in the in the season yet, but yet he's on the All-Star ballot. Wait, he, he's, he's on the All-Star ballot. He's on the All-Star ballot, but hasn't dribbled the ball this season in a Sixers uniform. That's, Incredible. That's pretty... Awkward, yeah. to say the least. He hasn't dribbled the ball. That, he hasn't scored a point yet. <laughs> this could be his first points if he played in the All-Star game. Wow. Hey, hey, you never know. It was not going to be back to what, January? January, possibly. So January, it's going to be an interesting possibly. season. Interesting season, definitely. It's always an interesting time when I've got these two up here. Brad Warfel, Marquita Holmes. Up next, it's going to conclude the show, IUP football style, as they beat ship 41-10 to get more about the game and what, they, uh, what happens to them next. you got to stay tuned after the commercial break. And welcome back to the big hit. Joining me now in the middle, Josh Carney on the end, Anthony Shear. And as I said before the break, IUP beat Shippensburg 41-10 in the game. All of us were at a great game. Mike Box, Terrell Barnes, career games, in my opinion anyway. I don't know about you guys. They uh, yeah, Box absolutely. only missed five passes on the day. Barnes, 100 Three touchdowns. Three touchdowns, 100, I want to say 50, probably 160. 120 yards. 120, okay, I'm a little off. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting here. That's why these guys have the numbers. You're welcome. Thank you, Josh. But, okay, let's get right on to it here, guys. As uh, IEP wins this game, as I said, 41-10, sitting third in the Region 1 rankings. And uh, let's recap this game against Ship a little bit. What did they do right to shut down Shippensburg's offense in Zach Zoli, who was coming in as the best quarterback quite possibly in Pennsylvania, quite possibly in the PSAC. Anthony, what did you think? I mean, when you shut down the number one team in the country offensively, they averaged 556 yards going in. IUP had a great game plan. IUP, more of a 4-3 defense, likes to play. They changed it up, played 3-3-6, which is three down linemen, three linebackers, and then they played uh, six defensive backs, or five defensive backs, excuse me. So what happens there is you have more defensive backs helping with receivers, which when you play someone like Shimmersburg goes four or five wide receivers deep. So... That's something they changed, and they stopped. They also did a great job stopping the run as well, but Zach Zilli was uncomfortable all day. 
they got pressure, and it started up with the defensive line, and specifically Carl Fleming, the linebacker. Mm -hmm. Fleming, coming off an injury from Gannon, had a great game, knocked a couple passes down, a lot of tackles, I think he had nine, and also had an interception touchdown late in the game. So That's sealed and the he, win. And he was also named uh, game MVP. Yeah, we talked about this in the round table where I had said, you know, the key for IEP defense is to get pressure on Zuli, get your hands up. He is only 6'1". They batted numerous passes down at the line, and they just got consistent pressure from Thornton, Akeem Smith, the Meisner brothers. Fleming played outstanding football, and he showed you right there everything in, in one play where he caught the screen and, and took it to the house, Anthony. And it was uncharacteristic of um, Zuli. He, was a, he came into the game completing 67% of his passes. And he was only 14 of 37. They got to him. They hit him time after time. They forced him to run. He's not known as a runner. And they, they shut down Baskerville and Harmon. They only combined for eight catches. And granted, Harmon had the touchdown. But this IEP defense really showed that they're going to be a dominant team, and you do not want to play them in the national playoffs. No, I mean, we've talked about it all year with this team. Defense wins championships. You're the number one rated defense in the country, and it was the, it was a highlight match of yeah. number one offense against the number one defense, and they proved once again that you have to have a dominating defense. And it looked like, and you look at Shippensburg's numbers, and you think, wow, they do a really great job. But a lot of those offenses in the PSAC East, they have five teams in the top ten in total offense in the, in the country. So it seems to me... In, the, in that part of the conference, they don't play any defense. Well, over here, you get teams like Mercyhurst, Cal, IUP, who thrive on defense. And IUP proved that this is a defense that is very good, physical, and they want to punch somebody in the mouth from the word go. And offensively, they did a great job. Box came out, looked solid every single time he dropped back to pass. 11 to 16, 178 yards, three touchdowns. All three went to Terrell Barnes. He had seven catches, made some outstanding plays. You know, he, he just really showed his playmaking ability and every catch he had. But the job that D'Antoine Williams did stepping in for Harvey Tuck, Harvey Tuck had one carry on the day for four yards. He was dealing with an injury. Williams stepped up, 30 carries, 125-plus yards. Monte Green stepped in when he needed, had 13 carries, close to 100 yards. This was a balanced attack, and it just shows, you know, how much talent this team has, you know, top to bottom. Anybody can go out there and play on this team. And I'm not concerned if – you know, they were dealing with injuries last week. I'm not concerned because I have all the confidence in the world that the next guy in line can step up and, and play. Yeah, you, guys like Dorian Lane who stepped up in this game who had to play a lot more than usual. Chris Brown has stepped up. I mean, a lot of guys we don't talk about. I mean, we, Johnny Franco, Carl Fleming, Carl Thornton, they get the headlines, they get the numbers and the stats, but, and Akeem Smith as well. But those are the guys that you need to win championships. And you mentioned DeAntoine Williams. Terrell Barnes probably the best game of his career at IUP. Oh, I mean, absolutely. he took and he did it without Pat Brewer on the other side of him. Brewer was dealing with an injury, missed a game. So, I mean, you're talking about a guy who literally has had an up-and-down season, had a bad game against Cal, and came back again to have a, probably his best performance. And, and talking about the, the amount of talent this team has, this is on an off note away from the game. There were 15 Crimson Hawks named to all PSAC West, or all PSAC teams, uh, first and second team. You had guys like, obviously, Harvey Tuck, who's a Harlan Hill uh, trophy finalist, so he's obviously going to make you know, the all-PSAC team. But guys like Pat Brewer, Carl Fleming, Carl Thornton, Johnny Franco, 15, and Coach Signetti was named all-PSAC coach. That says a lot about this program that they're building here. This is going to be a dominant program for years to come, and just seeing it all put together in one game against Shippensburg, where the cards were stacked against them, number one offense, you know, top 10 team in the nation, and they went out and they just beat them down. And it just shows a lot about what this program has done in the last two years under Signetti. Yeah, I've, I've uh, said a lot before, like, you know, for a uh, little reference here, in baseball, pitching beats hitting well in football, good defense will always beat a good offense. Yeah. And IEP defense came out and stepped up, proved why they're number one at Gannon game, why, and why that Gannon game was a fluke, giving up that many points. Coming to this game, stopped the nation's best offense, only allowing them to score 10 points, and the offense stepping up to, as you said, a bounce attack. And guys, as I said before, IUP is now third in the Region One rankings, I believe. Uh, who's who's in one and two? Right uh, now? Number one is Winston Salem State out of the CIAA. Okay. Number two is New Haven out of the NE10, and number three is IUP. Number four, four is, ship, is five ship, is Bloom, and six is Shepherd out of the WVIC. Now, number six is Shepherd. Quite uh, it's pretty funny we bring them up here because IUP has a home game this Saturday against number six Shepherd in the first round of the playoffs. And Anthony, I want to start it down with, there with you. What can Shepard bring to the table against IUP for this game? 
Uh, they're kind of a mirror image of IUP. They like to run the football. It's a very balanced attack. They are a physical team up front. I talking to Coach Signetti. This is the best defensive line they've played all year, and it's going to be a challenge. I mean, it's about time this offensive line for IUP, who's gotten a lot of props, Dan Matha, Anthony D. Pasquale, Byron Duvalis. It's time for them to earn their pay, and they've done it this year. Is they got to do against the best defensive line they're going to see all year. Shepard is. Uh, They've gone to throwing the ball a little bit more. They'll spread you out, but they will run the football. It, they start up front with their both offensive line, defensive line is what they're built on. Now you want to talk about mirror image of IUP. This team, Shepard, puts up 31.7 points a game, very close to IUP's season average. They, they run the ball uh, about 140 yards a game. They pass the ball about 230 yards a game. Their quarterback, Bobby Cooper, very efficient. Uh, he's thrown for over 2,100 yards, 15 TDs. But in the backfield, this team has so much depth. They have six people with over 100 yards in the regular season and over 25 carries. They like to run the ball with, with many people, get in, change of pace backs, and receiving, they spread it out. Their leading receiver only has 41 catches. So this team spreads you out, but then can bring in different backs and run the ball. Defensively, we talked about this earlier, those, those numbers are kind of crunched because they haven't really played anyone out of, out of the, the CIAA. But I think their true test is going to come against IUP. should be a great game. Uh, all the confidence in the world this Crimson Hawks team can, can make a deep run in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you look at the teams that they would have to potentially play. I mean, if they win this game, you're going up to the Smurf Turf, up, Smurf Turf excuse me, up in New Haven. And that would be an interesting matchup against a team that, again, is kind of a mirror image of Shepard, kind of the best team in a weak conference. That Some of these conferences that they're going to see teams from, the rest of the conference isn't that great, and these teams are taking advantage of that. But overall... I mean, this team, after what you said, two years back in the playoffs, and it's funny that the first playoff game under Kurt Signetti is the last time they've been in the playoffs was 2007. They lost to Shepard at George P. Miller Stadium. So a little chance for redemption. I mean, none of those players were here at the time, but a chance to kind of redeem themselves and start back in this program being a top program in Division Two. Now, guys, quickly, what does IUP have to do to stop Shepard? Continue playing football the way they are. Get pressure on the quarterback. You, you, you man up on the outside, you play bump and run, or, or you drop off and give them room. These corners, Toussaint, um, Holloway, McFadden. Mc, McFadden, and Franco, Griffin, and Brown in the backfield, and Marvais Bird, these guys can cover anyone in the nation. Um, just continue playing solid defense the way they are, physical defense. Berdahl, Fleming, Dorian Lane at linebacker. These guys fly around, hit you in the mouth, and I, I really think they're going to make a statement here against Shepard. Anthony? Everything that Josh said, I agree. I mean... When they got the ball, I was always, I, my opinion was when they got the ball against Shippensburg, I would have taken the ball and run it down their throat and prove you're dominant. Instead, Kurt Signetti said, let's put our defense out there and let's test them from the word go. And his defense answered the call. And to me, I don't think anybody in this country is going to be com com compare to what this defense can bring you. Right, They're going to punch somebody in the mouth every time they get a chance to. And you might call it dirty, you might call it whatever, but you're never going to see a team more physical than IUP. And you're looking at this defense that has – Three Division One transfers, Division One talents that transferred into this program, Carl Fleming and the Meisner brothers. Um, they, they play huge roles in this defense. Fleming looks to me like a Division One player. He could play anywhere in the nation right now. He is dominating. He, he has all the athletic ability in the world. This defense is scary. If I'm, if I'm a Shepherds quarterback, Bobby Cooper, I'm not ready for this game. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm scared. Yeah, you're going to be worried going into this one. Shepard? Number six, number three, IUP this Saturday here at George P. Miller Stadium. I know we're all going to be leaving for Thanksgiving break, but make sure you stay around an extra day to catch this game. It's going to be a good one. That's going to do it here for all of us at the Big Hit. Make sure you catch us every Wednesday through Friday at 10 p.m. on the one and only IUP TV. You can check out our YouTube channel, IUP TV, The Big Hit as well. For producer Josh Carney, Anthony Shear, director Jess Owalk, everybody behind the scenes and everybody backstage, I'm Tim Quigley. Have a safe and happy Thanksgiving break, everybody.